Father Barnabas Powell is pastor of Saints Raphael, Nicholas, and Irene, Greek Orthodox Church of Cumming, Georgia, USA. Here's Father Barnabas with Sunday's homily. We live in a day and an age where symbols have proven to be something more than just the empty placeholders that too many times we think of them as. When I was growing up as a Protestant, I thought the Lord's Supper was just a symbol. Make no mistake, it is a symbol. But the word symbol doesn't mean a placeholder for something that's missing. This is extremely important, my angels, because if you miss this, then you're going to miss and misunderstand why there's such societal turmoil today over symbols. The reason is, dear ones, is because symbols mean something. Symbols are significant. Symbols matter. And the reason why we have so much angst over symbols today, whether we're angry at a symbol or angry at the people who are angry at a symbol, symbols matter. They hold great power. And to ignore that is to ignore a fundamental way for you to understand yourself and your world. If you misunderstand yourself and your world, you will live a life of quiet desperation and not understanding why you're here. If you miss this important and significant reality... You're not going to understand yourself. Whole psychological philosophies have been built over this understanding of symbols. The great Carl Jung, the great um, philosopher and and, and psychiatrist and brilliant man, had an entire career based on trying to uncover the power of symbol and the power of the sacred. Jung was convinced that the archetypes that we see in our world are big deals. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, you wouldn't have Hollywood and wouldn't have stories and wouldn't have movies and dramas and books if it weren't for the power of archetypes and symbols. Someone once said that the the reality is there's only been one true story ever told in the history of the world. And that story is repeated in a million different ways when the hero faces a a conflict and he overcomes the conflict and he wins or he overcomes the conflict and dies and somebody, somebody else takes his place. But that symbolic world that we live in all around us holds such pregnancy of meaning that if we miss it, We miss understanding who we really are. It's a big deal. I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Jonathan Peugeot in the symbolic world, but if you ever get a chance to look it up on the internet and watch some of Jonathan's, Jonathan is a a tremendously gifted thinker and artist. He's a wonderful carver, and he lives in Canada. But we don't hold that against him. That's That's not his fault. But he's a brilliant young man, and he's, he has this entire um, uh, website called The Symbolic World, and he goes through and he, and he unpacks the symbols of Hollywood movies, and he unpacks the symbols that we see going around us, and he talks about that. It's really fascinating. I encourage you to look it up. He's a wonderful and faithful Orthodox Christian and a brilliant young man, and it's somebody that, uh, that I have a great deal of confidence in, so I recommend him highly to you. And I say all that because, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ is going to use very symbolic and archetypal language in our homily, in our, in our gospel lesson today. Jesus is going to say to the people who are listening to him, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Then he's going to say that if a man is going to save his life, he must lose it. And then he's going to get very concrete and say, If you are ashamed of me in this particular generation, this adulterous and unfaithful generation, I will be ashamed of you before my Father. And I want to unpack that a little bit. The first thing that I want you to notice is Jesus says to you and me today, if we're actually going to be followers of Jesus Christ and not just simply someone who's in a good religious habit, by the way, there's nothing wrong with a good religious habit unless it stops there then pretty soon it just becomes a little thing that you carry around in your head that doesn't really mean that much to you. 
And that's, brothers and sisters, by the way, that's carried over into the next generation and the generation after that. A weak commitment to the Orthodox Christian faith will show up in the next generation as a weaker commitment still. And in the following generation, probably no commitment at all to the Orthodox faith. That's reality. You're not going to escape it, fuss, scream, holler, kick, say I, I, I meant to be different, all that kind of stuff. It's not going to happen. It is what is. But Jesus tells us today that we must take up our cross and follow him. Now, no Jew in that audience misunderstood what he meant. There's only one purpose for a cross. Now, we wear it around our necks. I never will forget the story of a Hollywood uh, uh, actor being asked about the cross that he wears around his neck. And he says, oh, that's just jewelry. It doesn't mean anything at all. It's just jewelry. Well, brothers and sisters, when you empty a symbol of its meaning, you empty it of itself. Just like when you empty yourself of the meaning of you being created in the image of God, you empty yourself of the ontological reality of who you are, you become a stranger to yourself. Do you understand that? And how many of us have we seen in our society today that are absolutely strangers to themselves? How many times have you found out, you know what, I wasn't the man or the woman I thought I was? The pressures of the moment, the pressures and the difficulties of the life uncover your real self and you get to look at your real self without the facade that we've created about ourselves in front of us and we are confronted with our true selves. In that moment, we are given the opportunity, the choice, the question, the challenge. Will I take up my cross and follow Christ or will I fall back into the delusion of my fantasy life? Jesus Christ says we are called to take up our cross. There's only one use for a cross, folks. It isn't a decoration. It's not a piece of jewelry. It's not something on the top of the church building that says, oh, well, that's where the Christians meet, even though that means that. It's much more than that, ladies and gentlemen. It is nothing less, brothers and sisters, this morning on this, this Sunday after the exaltation of the Holy Cross where you and I are confronted by Jesus Christ with this stark and real truth. You must take up that which will kill the false idea of yourself so that the real true you can become who you really are. It will take death. The death of fantasy. The death of delusion. The death of the facade that we've carried around about ourselves over and over again. Why do you think that the Christian faith constantly calls us to matanya, to repentance? Because it is only by reorienting the way we think towards reality that we are ever going to confront the true thing that needs to die in us, the false view of who we are. And that's why Jesus then adds, if a man is going to save his life, he must lose it. If a man is truly going to save his life, if a woman is truly going to become the, the woman she's created to be, she must be willing to lose the false view of her life so that the true view of her life can come to, come, come to pass. And then Jesus adds a very stark and concrete phrase. He says to you and me today that if we are ashamed of Jesus Christ in this wicked and adulterous generation, look at those two phrases there, wicked and adulterous, doing evil and being unfaithful. A generation that is doing evil and being unfaithful is a generation that has forgotten its true purpose, a generation that has forgotten its true self. A generation that has abandoned the notion that I have some fidelity to my Creator. That I am called to be faithful, not unfaithful, to the God who made me and to whom I will give an account. When a generation forgets that, symbols become hated. Symbols become the stark reminder of what I've abandoned. 
symbols become the stark reminder and the confrontation of my own unfaithfulness. Why do you think they mark on themselves and they mark on the statues and they tear things down and set things afire? Because to look at it is to look into the mirror of what they could have been and what they have failed to achieve because of infidelity to the Creator. Lord, have mercy no wonder the generation, no wonder the nation, no wonder the society is in turmoil. It has forgotten God. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said the same thing. He was asked, how could the Russian nation, after centuries of being formed by the Christian faith, fall into communism? How could they have done that? And Alexander Solzhenitsyn said there is one answer and one answer only. They forgot God. This morning, you and I are confronted, especially in, during times of civil strife and during times of societal upheaval, to not be quiet or closet Christians, but to be purposeful, visible, and brave followers of Jesus Christ, even in the face of the world who hates us. You and I are called to rise up to the occasion and to stand as beacons of light so that men and women who have forgotten who they are, who have lost the ability to tell the difference between fantasy and reality, you and I are called to be the men and women who stand in the midst of the darkness of this chaos and be light and a way home. For those who oppose themselves, who are their own worst enemy. There is no time in this society, during this day and age, for us to be hidden believers. It is time for us to stand strong. It is time for us to screw our courage to the, to the wall. And to rise up and stand unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the fullness of meaning, the symbol who is himself reality, and not deny Jesus Christ by hiding or cowardice or being silent in the face of blatant evil. We cannot be quiet, nor will we, by God's grace. Amen. You can follow Father Barnabas on YouTube or on our church website at stsrni.org. Thank you for watching.